next on The Broadway Show. Don't whistle on the elevator. We're talking to the star of the revival of Death of a Salesman, Wendell Pierce. Plus, it's the biggest thriller of Broadway, MJ the Musical. I'm sitting with the man who plays the king of pop, Miles Frost. And it's your last chance to see the music man on Broadway. Tony winner Sutton Foster is on the show. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. It's The Broadway Show, and we are back with another good one. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Don't whistle on the elevator. It's Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. And for the very first time, the Broadway revival has a black lead. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. Wendell Pierce wowed audiences in London as Willie Loman, and now he's playing the Titanic role on Broadway at the Hudson Theater. I caught up with the stage and screen favorite just across the street from his current stomping grounds. <laughs> Wendell, so good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you, too. How's Broadway treating you? You seem like uh, you're having a nice, a nice run. I, I'm having uh, the time of my life. It's uh, a great challenge. It's tiring but in a good way. It's a, a sense of satisfaction and um, uh, a sense of accomplishment at the end of the evening. You're in Death of a Salesman. Yes. Critically acclaimed, beautiful production. So Willie Loman, that's one of the big Titanic yes. <laughs> stage roles yes. for an actor. Do you ever dream you would see it on your resume? I did not, but I, I actually met a young actor last night as I came out of the theater. And he reminded me that I told him years ago that I wanted to do the role. I had not remembered it. Um, and then when the offer came, I jumped at the chance. I leapt at the chance because it is one of the great challenges. I, every night, I feel as though I'm at the base camp of Mount Everest looking up. And at the end of the evening, I have to summit. And um, it, 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 is, it challenges me every part of my being and it is the thing that makes me um, really appreciative of all the work that I've done in preparation for it. When you have a career, you've had an incredible career, film and TV and stage, mm -hmm. does it feel like sort of the culmination of the hard work Absolutely. when you have something like this? Absolutely. It's kismet that at this point of my life and in my career that I'm playing the role because um, there's a, a, a catharsis of, of career and of my personal journey that I am doing this reflection on, this self-reflection that serves the play and serves an illumination and understanding of the play and then the lessons that the play teaches, you know, um, that there's your first wealth is love, love of family and not of materialistic things, um, how to deal with those insurmountable odds and so it is the culmination of my career coming together. Arthur Miller wrote an incredible family drama, American family drama. Mm -hmm. This is the first time on Broadway it's a black family. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that factor is instrumental to the success of what audiences are feeling in this production or sort of incidental? It is absolutely instrumental to the impact that it's having on people. Because it is so impactful, uh, because it enlightens the material, amplifies the themes of the material even more because what was the usual humiliation, the usual self-destruction, the, the usual uh, variables that are placed in front of Willie's pursuit of this American dream become even more uh, insurmountable, going back to that word, because of uh, the, the, the micro and macro aggressions that were happening in the racial culture of this country for a black family in 1949. So the illumination of all the, the pain in the play and the conflict of the play is heightened with a black family. And the reason you do revivals is to bring a new interpretation. So the African-American experience, along with a, a vital and visceral Willie who fights to the end before he ever gives up, um, I think are the two things I'm proudest of in our interpretation and production. This is your latest triumph. What was your first stage triumph as a kid? <laughs> My first play ever was in kindergarten. I played Chicken Little. The sky is falling down. <laughs> turkey Lurkey. And I remember Turkey Lurkey. I can't remember everybody else. But the sky is falling down. The sky is falling down. And I had on a really wonderful little 
short sleeve white shirt with a yellow bow tie and yellow pants, you know? So it was, it was great. I was, I was chicken little. So when you say that Willie Loman is the culmination of everything you've ever done, you're including chicken little. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> when I'm having those flashbacks, when I am having the, the synaptic nerves of fly, falling off, man, Willie Loman is the first one saying the sky is falling in. You know what I'm saying? He's the, he's the first one. He's hearing voices. He's, he's seeing things. Oh, yeah. Diamonds shining in the dark, hard and rough. I could just pick up. I see it like a diamond. I see diamonds. You know, I hear voices. Oh, yeah. The sky is falling in on oh, Willie. Definitely. A man must have a code. Oh, no doubt. I have to ask you, this is for Zach, the director of the show, who's not here. Okay. But I have to ask you one thing about The Wire. Yes. You had an amazing TV success with The Wire. Yeah. It is regularly sort of credited as maybe the best TV show, right. one of the best TV right. shows. We're always in the top five, at least. Yeah, top right. five, right. definitely top five. How does, it, how does it feel to be a part of something like that? Uh, it feels very special. I wish it for everyone, right? Uh, we always know I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. It's the opposite. I wish this for every actor, that they would have something that's so defining of their work yeah. uh, in the arc of their uh, career. And I think Death of a Salesman is going to be that for me now. I've become a part of a small fraternity of men who played the role that I think about every night. Mm. You know, I, I think of the five men who played it on Broadway. Mm. Uh, I, I feel personally connected to them because I know what that feeling is like before the, the curtain rises. Yeah. I feel connected to Lee J. Cobb and Dustin Hoffman and, and, and Philip Seymour Hoffman, yeah. Brian Dennehy, and Joyce C. Scott. Yeah. I go, I know. I know. <laughs> I know how daunting the evening seems right now and how fulfilling and satisfying it will be in a couple of hours. The leaves are falling and the stars are shining this autumn on Broadway, and we've got another huge opening to tell you about. K-pop brings the sounds of the South Korean pop musical phenomenon to Broadway. That musical just celebrated opening night at Circle in the Square. On opening night, we hit the red carpet with the stars. I really tried to pay homage and pay tribute to you know, this musical genre that made me feel like home wherever I went. I moved around a lot all my life and K-pop has always been like home to me. It was like my comfort food and I really wanted to share that with the world. And so um, what I'm hoping that, you know, the audience will get from it is what K-pop means to me. You know, it's like a variety of things. It's not just like one emotion. It's not just one song that I consider K-pop. It's like an array of emotions, array of um, stories that are told through music and dance and um, I just want to share that with the world. This show is unlike anything that anybody has ever seen before. It is Korean culture on Broadway, which has never been done. It is 20, one of the 22 people in this cast being AAPI. That's something that's never happened either. And at the end of the day, it is a celebration of Asian joy on Broadway. There's never been any show like this before. And it's just to be surrounded by all these like Asian American, amazing, amazing performers and creatives. It's just so humbling and exciting. Oh, audience is like all about the K-pop. They're like, every time when we do something, they like bring the energy, just like K-pop concert. They're like, yeah, like they just screaming their character names. And we already have our fan club and fan names. And it's just incredible. I really believe that we can really showcase what it is uh, to audiences who don't know what K-pop is. And um, it's it's really, there's something for everyone, whether you're a K-pop fan or a Broadway fan. We want to send a shout out to three-time Tony nominee and friend of the show, Brian Darcy James. Brian is up for an Independent Spirit Award for Best Supporting Performance in the movie, The Cathedral. You can stream it now on just about all digital platforms. You can see Brian starring on Broadway right now as a baker in Into the Woods. It is Broadway's biggest thriller, MJ the Musical, and Miles Frost won the Tony this year as Best Leading Actor in a Musical. I had a chance to get to know the man in the mirror himself, Miles Frost. 
let's talk about you and where, where you started in all this and where you were before you ended up on Broadway in this starring role. When I got the role, I was, I was still in college. I was in my senior year of college over at Bowie State University. And, uh, but before this, you know, I, was, I didn't really have any plans or intentions in going into Broadway. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an artist by trade. You know, I write, I sing, I play piano, drums. It's a few talents. A few, you know, a few <laughs> talents. Um, but that's where my that's where the core of my of my passion lies, and um, when I got this opportunity, I was like, who who passed this up? You know, I'd done some talent shows in high school, singing and dancing to Michael Jackson. I won those talent shows, and I was like, you know, I like being on stage, I like dancing, and I. I'm gonna I have to look 16, at all your talent show reels. I know, I know. <laughs> when I was 16, it was my junior year, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna do Billie Jean this year, and uh, I did it. My mom's in the back holding her iPad up. <laughs> with the flash on <laughs> and um, you know I, I came out on the hoverboard because that's some oh, hoverboards that's was, yeah that's I was like how can I be out of the box right. yeah, I was trying to find ways to just be super creative came out on the hoverboard went into the position that did Billie Jean my mom posted on YouTube mm -hmm. and that was 2016 2021 is when I got the call and I got a call saying hey uh, we found this video of you doing Billie Jean. I see that it's dated um, 2016. Can you like? Do you, can you still do that, but like sing better and, and dance better? I was like, yeah. When I got off the phone, I was like, I hadn't done that since then. I was like, I was lying. I was like, uh, <laughs> I hope. I, I hope so, <laughs> you know. You were in college. Yeah, I was. Well, you got this call and you couldn't say no, but you made a promise. Mm -hmm. Who'd you make that promise to that you were gonna go back to school? I made that promise to my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother was an elementary school teacher for over 40 years and she's 88 now. I had a conversation with her and my mother at the same time. I was like, you know, I, I like college, you know, college is cool, but it's not really my thing. I'm not really feeling it all too much. And let's just say hypothetically, right? A big opportunity came that was life changing, <laughs> and you know, I, I, it was either continue to go to school or you know, drop out and pursue that. My mom was, you know, she was like, okay, well, I mean, if it's, you know, we'll take a look at the opportunity depending on what it is, and if it's something that we feel like is secure enough, then you know, then we'll go ahead and do it. But and my grandma was like, <laughs> but see, my grandmother, what I love about her is she. She is a believer in Miles Frost, mm -hmm. and she's definitely my number one fan. And she said, if it was anybody else, I would say no. But I, I believe that whatever God has in store for you, and you take it and run with it, you're going to be the biggest thing in the world. But if that does happen, you got to finish at some point. I don't, I don't care when you finish, but you have to finish. And I said, I can do that. I want to show you a Michael Jackson post. All right. Let's try to, let's try to do All this right. pose. Made me look good. I got you. Made me look good. I got good. you. I'm going to make it look good. I'll tell good. you what. <laughs> <laughs> so, walk out with my hat, right? You got your, got your okay, hat in your got hand. That. Right? You stand like this, got your fedora, put your fedora to your side, kind of bring your knees together, and then squat like that just a little bit. So, you're going to say, give me this move. Gotta go slow. And then you can put your hat in your head when you do it. So, three, two, one. Give me this move. Oh gosh. <laughs> all right, one more time, one more time, one more time. Do it slow. So, your feet go. It all goes together with you. Boom. Mm -hmm. So when your feet go like that, mm -hmm. your hand goes up with it. And put your hand on your head okay. like that. So, three, two, one. Give me this move, group. Yeah. Anywhere close to you? <laughs> no. There you go. That's it right there. All That's right. it. All right, you're good. Want to see more of my interview? Head over to broadway.com for an extended cut. This is a Broadway show, and we're back in just a few. Thanks for staying with us for this latest episode of the Broadway show. You got trouble. You've got just a few weeks left to make it to River City. The Tony nominated revival of The Music Man now ends its run on January 15th. Let's check back in with Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. The Music Man, Mark Sutton Foster's seventh Tony Award nomination. I got to sit down with Mary and the Librarian herself at the stunning, historic Morgan Library and Museum.
you are playing Marion the Librarian, and here we are. I know. And we are at J. Pierpont Morgan's legendary library. This is a very famous New York City landmark. It's incredible. Uh, I've never been here. It's so of, beautiful. I'm glad that we were able to bring you here. Part of this, this is part of the Morgan Library and Museum. People should visit it. Yeah, Marion would lose her mind. In here. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, she would, and she would, she would run a tight ship. <laughs> yeah, she would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I could picture you on like ladders oh, and doing a whole oh, yeah. library oh, yeah. number with oh, you, yeah. Jackman. I see it <laughs> exactly. <laughs> For the movie, yeah. let's do a movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You are a very talented performer. We've seen you do many things, but I think of Mary Librarian as a very sort of rigid soprano, ingenue. I don't immediately think Sutton Foster. Me neither. It was a surprise, it was a surprise for, for me as well. Yeah. So I remember getting a call from my agent about it, and they, they said they're doing a revival with Hugh Jackman of The Music Man, and they're talking about you as Marion. And I went, what? <laughs> my first reaction, I, I, there's probably 20 people I would cast before me. You know, I was kind of like, oh, that's so, I was like, we, why? That's weird. <laughs> and then because that was my first reaction, I went, huh. Right. Maybe there's something. It intrigues you. It intrigued me. Yeah, yeah, the leap or the or the challenge or the oh maybe there's an opportunity there or maybe there's another way in or another way to see her. And so like right after I was cast, I was like maybe I should watch the movie. <laughs> so we watched the movie, and I was like oh I see I see something here. Mm -hmm. I was like I saw like a backstory, and I was like oh she's got some she's got a past. She uh -huh. has some, there's something going on. I was like oh she's there's there's something to work with here. And then it was two years later until we started rehearsal. Working with Jerry Zachs and working with Hugh and and they were talking about this other version of My White Knight. Long ago there was this extended version of My White mm -hmm. Knight, and uh, that had had this huge patter section in the start because. The only the way I knew my White Knight was just the sure. the traditional, yep. you know, sort of ballady thing, and then as soon as they introduced that, I was like, oh, okay. That was your end. It was yeah. kind of, but then, oddly enough, I was still sort of freaked out by how she sounded. How do I find her voice? You know, and we played with keys and all these things, and I, but I still felt like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be this. Mm. Yeah, I'm supposed to fit into this mold, and then. Oddly, with um, playing Reno again in London, I was walking to the theater, and and I was like, "Well, why can't Marion? Why can't the end of My White Knight be big? Why can't? Why does it have to be that?" And I was like, "No, why can't she have?" I was like, "That's one of my strengths. This is her most, you know, right. this is the strongest moment of, for her vocally in the show." And I was like, "So I like came in." to poor Patrick, our music director, and I was like, I think I want to change the end of this, and I came in, and he, he was, in, to his credit, and to everybody, they were like, let's try it. And so we just like tried all these different ways, and we, that song just kept evolving and changing and growing, and then it was this thing, I felt like I was wrestling, but then I was like, I was like oh, so is Marion, and then the minute I let go of trying to be something else and just tried to find my way in, then it just unfolded. It's like one of my proudest things that a, characters I've ever sort of found is, is with her. Want to see more of Paul's interview? Head over to Broadway.com for an extended cut. We'll be right back. We're celebrating another huge opening night on Broadway. The timeless classic, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It's back on Broadway, but we've never seen it like this. Tony winner Jefferson Mays, yes, plays more than 50 parts, including a potato in this wild and glorious reimagining. Check it out while you can. We want to tell you about a few holiday happenings in the Broadway community. Emmy winner Darren Chris is celebrating the season in concert. Darren was on Broadway last summer in American Buffalo. Now he's kicking off his A Very Daring Christmas live tour, plus an extended run at Cafe Carlisle in Manhattan. Another Glee Emmy winner is heading to Joe's Pub. Recent Funny Girl star Jane Lynch is joining friend Kate Flannery of The Office for a swinging little Christmas December 2nd, 3rd and 4th. 
On December 5th, a bunch of Broadway faves, including Tony nominee Jeanette Bayardell and one of the stars of Six, Samantha Polly, are lighting up the stage at Sony Music Hall with Broadway Sings Mariah Carey, a holiday spectacular. And finally, James Monroe Eichelhardt is bringing his family holiday playlist show to 54 Below December 8th and 9th. The Broadway show is back in just a sec. That's going to do it for us, but until next time, check out The Broadway Show Uncut wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.